My thanks to Catherine Owen, the Metamorphic Studies Group Committee for this invitation. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you're located. Uh, what I thought I would start with, first of all, is to just tell everybody how we ended up with the Metamorphic Studies Group. During the 1970s, I used to attend the Tectonic Studies Group meet annual meetings. Uh, in those days, they were in December at a university around the country. TSG started in 1971 as a special interest group of the Geological Society. But by 1979, it had become clear that the direction of research presentations in the Tectonic Studies Group were moving more towards industry with the uh, opening up of the North Sea. And I was talking with Tony Barber at the 1979 meeting, bemoaning the fact that uh, studies in ductile crust were unlikely to continue to be presented at the meeting. And uh, what was I going to do? And Tony suggested that uh, I propose a metamorphic studies group and that he was on council of the Geological Society, he would present it to council. I wrote the proposal, he presented it to council, council approved it. Bernard Leake was the treasurer of the Geological Society at the time, and he was also on the uh, Mineralogical Society's uh, council. He, he may well have been treasurer, I don't actually remember. And he suggested that uh, I make the proposal to the Mineralogical Society Council as well, and that we consider this as a joint special interest group. It was approved by the Mineralogical Society Council and it became the first joint special interest group of both societies. And I think it has been extremely successful for both societies. And as Catherine said, particularly for the Mineralogical Society of uh, Mineralogical Society. In the early days, uh, we ran a number of meetings. The, uh, Inaugural meeting was in 1981, as you heard, the research, first research in progress meeting, which is where we formally elected a committee, although we had gone ahead trying to uh, put people in place before the meeting itself. We also, in those early years, tended to run a, a larger multi-day meeting as well as uh, the research in progress meeting. And you can see in 1970, uh, 1982, we managed to run three meetings. And in 1983, we had a, a large meeting on dull radiant metamorphism. And that was in fact uh, associated with the first field trip that the MSG ran that was uh, organized and run by Ben Hart and was uh, an outstanding trip to the uh, Northeast Highlands. Here you can see the speakers at the uh, Lewis and metamorphism meeting. Um, most of us looking somewhat younger in those days. Unfortunately, Vic Wall is no longer with us. Um, and then, the, Met, the, the Journal of Metamorphic Geology. Now this is a, a, a slightly different, has a slightly different origin. Uh, in 1980, I came onto the Council of the Geological Society and uh, Tony Harris was the uh, publication secretary and he cornered me at a meeting of council and asked me whether the new Metamorphic Studies Group was interested in starting a journal. And the reason he did that was because in 1979, Paul Hancock had had a lunch meeting with Peter Henn at Pergamon Press and proposed starting a journal of structural geology. That was uh, supported by Pergamon and Paul had gone to the Tectonic Studies Group Committee and obtained their support for the journal, but he'd never talked to the Geological Society about the possibility of the journal being published through the society. So Tony was trying to head off the uh, posse at the pass here. And uh, he asked me whether I would uh, be prepared to consider working with Blackwell Scientific Publications who were the society's publishers at the time to create a proposal for a new journal. I formally wrote to 30 international senior people in the international metamorphic community. I received 29 positive responses. I received 29 responses, all positive. And two of the most enthusiastic responders were Tim Loomis and Ron Vernon, neither of whom I'd met at the time. And we made the proposal to the Geological Society Council. Unfortunately, Bernard Leake as uh, treasurer uh, was rather pessimistic about uh, finances at the time, partly because the society was preparing to bring its publications in house or thinking about bringing its publications in house, even though it took quite a few years for it to do so. And after much discussion at council, council decided not to go ahead with the journal and uh, wrote formally to Blackwell saying that uh, Blackwell could go ahead on their own, but the Geological Society wasn't going to be involved. 
Blackwell then asked me if I would like to uh, continue working with them to develop the journal and the rest is history. And uh, I managed to uh, stick it out for 38 years. Okay, so my task was to give you some kind of perspective from the past 40 years. Of course, this is going to be a personal selection simply because there's far too much material to cover. So I think uh, we can refer to this 40 years of the golden age of metamorphic uh, studies. Um, admittedly, I've uh, plagiarized that uh, title from uh, uh, the uh, Mineralogical Society of America's Centennial. And I think uh, we've seen a lot of progress in this 40 year period with both quantification of pressure temperature conditions, pressure temperature time paths, metamorphism and tectonics, reaction mechanisms, porphyroblast nucleation and growth, rates of processes from grain to origin scale. But all of this was built on a foundation in the 1960s and 1970s before the formation of the metamorphic studies group. And it developed with the introduction of the electron microprobe. Now, those of you that were at the Metamorphic Studies Group Research in Progress meeting last year, which was somewhat delayed because of COVID, might remember Claire Warren's uh, medal talk, award talk, Bowen award talk, um, sorry, Barrow award talk, when she referred to the number of toys available in departments these days to play with. Of course, in the 1960s, uh, we had one toy, the petrographic microscope, and that was then supplemented by a few electron microprobes widely spaced around different countries. What you see here is the first on the left-hand image, the first Garnet zoning profile published by Link Hollister, who's, uh, this was part of his PhD work at Caltech, published in Science in 1966. And then on the right, one of the classic uh, papers mapping Garnet zoning, showing the uh, iron, magnesium, calcium, and manganese distribution in this Garnet from uh, Massachusetts. And that was in a paper with uh, Peter Robinson and Alan Thompson. Unfortunately, Bob is no longer with us either. And of course, in the 40 years, we've, we can jump forward to uh, Freya George's uh, award-winning article. And we see here uh, examples of the toys available to us with X-ray tomography at the top left, allowing us to locate all the porphyroblasts in a sample and then on the right hand uh, image, the kind of mapping that we can undertake these days in order to uh, make deductions about garnet nucleation and growth. One of the other aspects of our work, of course, is to track metamorphic pressure temperature time paths. And uh, these we can think of as metamorphic flight recorders that record the journey uh, from surface back to surface for us. And it's been our task to uh, unravel that journey in a quantitative way. So each PT datum uh, that we determine records a point on a geotherm that's been crossed during a dynamic orogenic evolution, either from higher to lower thermal gradients in a clockwise sense in PT space, or from higher to lower thermal gradients in a counterclockwise sense in PT space. And we know that to fully characterize metamorphic rocks, we need not just temperature and pressure, we need to think in terms of the thermo thermobaric ratio, the actual shape of the path. We need to think about age of peak metamorphism and uh, other points for which we can determine some timing so that we have rates at which burial and exhumation and other processes occur. And we've become really, really good at this task. Um, even 30 years ago, just over 30 years ago, we can go back to the meeting in Dublin, jointly sponsored with the uh, IGCP Project 235, that produced the Geological Society Special Publication, Volume 43, Evolution of Metamorphic Belts, which is characterized by having uh, nearly 40 short articles with quantitative PTT information. Perhaps the most stunning advance in the last 40 years, and it in fact only took 30 years, is in geochronology. From, from the first, one of the first studies of metamorphic zircons in 1986, through to the reviews in mineralogy and geochemistry volume on petrochronology in 2017. I, I find the progress in 30 years to be amazing. Uh, I, I can't imagine that we could have predicted this 
back in the 1980s. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's been incredibly important to the last decade of studies in uh, metamorphic geology. But one of the things that uh, uh, is important from my point of view is the uh, development of studies in ultra high temperature metamorphism and ultra high pressure metamorphism. And we went through a period where it, it seemed that everybody was trying to get the highest temperature and sometimes the highest pressure, uh, a period that Roger Powell re regarded as people following the principle of maximum astonishment. Um, and I think we've rather got past that now and uh, we've become a lot more blasé perhaps about both UHT and UHP metamorphism. UHT metamorphism uh, appeared on the stage first and by 1980, as uh, you can see on this slide, regional scale ultra high temperature metamorphism had been confirmed in the Napier complex based on a number of studies stretching back to 1968, beautifully summarized in uh, Simon Harley's uh, Encyclopedia of Geology uh, review. But it was not really until Simon's article in the uh, Geological Society special publication in 1998 that it was formally defined as uh, temper metamorphism at temperatures greater than 900 degrees. <clears throat> so the definition uh, that Simon uh, is using today is that UHT metamorphism forms the higher temperature part of the granulite fascias, which spans conditions of 3 to 18 kilobar and 700 to 1100 C. It's only in the last 20 years that UHT has become fully recognized as a widespread and important style of metamorphism. I hope Simon won't take too much offense. He knows we disagree on this point, but uh, I don't really see the difference between metamorphism at uh, just over 900 and metamorphism at just under 900. Um, and so I prefer to think of this as metamorphism within a range of thermobaric ratios, and this being rather a continuum of process from lower to higher temperature. The real problem with UHT metamorphism, of course, is both how to do the heat and how to pull these rocks slowly. Time scales of UHP metamorphism are shown here on the left from Simon's article. And what I've shown on the right is an unpublished plot by uh, Chris Clark and myself, which relates the minimum area that we have today for a particular UHT terrain and the duration of the UHT metamorphism. And what you can see from both plots, if you're familiar with some of these locations, is that size matters. It's the really big UHT provinces that have the long duration, slow cooling PT paths, and they are very difficult to explain. So the heat is the first problem, and this has been addressed on a number of occasions, going back well before Becky Jameson. She concurred with previous workers that tectonically accreted or thickened heat producing crustal material is important, Chris Clark in the uh, Elements uh, Review concluded that uh, along with high internal concentrations of heat producing elements and low erosion rates is the most likely setting. And Simon has just argued that radiogenic self-heating in a large hot collision origin is the most viable explanation for long duration UHT. This all relies on uh, heat producing elements and uh, there's no question that that's an important component but I do wonder whether there's a, a larger role for mantle heat that we're missing in this problem. And I think that's particularly true for long duration UHT metamorphism with counterclockwise PT paths of which the Eastern Ghats uh, is close to my heart. The other problem as I see it with UHT metamorphism is cooling. And again, this is unresolved as far as I'm concerned. In fact, I don't think it's really been worked on since Ron Oxborough in 1990 presented at the 1987 granulites and granulites meeting, although I made an attempt to explain the Eastern Ghats cooling uh, the granulites and granulites meeting in India in 2013, but uh, not very successfully. So here's a quote from Ron Oxborough, some regional granulite terrains cooled extremely slowly. It is so difficult to find the means of cooling the crust very slowly that it provides a tight constraint on the processes by which they form. Cooling over 100 million years or more implies that conductive transfer of heat occurs over vertical distances considerably greater than the thickness of continental crust and strongly suggests that both crust and mantle are involved. And the scale of this problem can be seen from the uh, 
well, the, the, the commonality of it is in, seen from the top figure with the close to isobaric cooling parts. And in the bottom figure, uh, the rate of cooling that's recently been calculated for at least 100 million years in the Eastern Gats Belt, and that may well have continued down to the Pan-African event at 0.3 degrees C per million years for over 100 million years. This is extraordinarily difficult to explain for a metamorphic belt that reaches UHT conditions on a counterclockwise PT path. And then in 1984, we have the appearance of UHT, UHP metamorphism. In fact, I think this uh, largely came in in 1983 when Christian Chopin was at a Penrose conference and stunned everybody with a pyro garnet. Uh, but what we see here is the uh, hand sample from the southern end of the Dora Myra Massif in the Alps and uh, an image of uh, coesite included in garnet with the radial cracks and the palisade quartz around the interface between the coesite relict and the garnet itself. And uh, there is also in the uh, Encyclopedia of Geology a review, although it's rather short, of uh, ultra high pressure metamorphism. And ultra high pressure metamorphism is metamorphism of crustal rocks in the PT region above the quartz coesite reaction boundary. That's to say, higher than about 2.8 GPA at 600 C. And it's characterized by the appearance of coesite or diamond. Now, again, in this particular review, the authors have decided to divide UHP metamorphism by temperature into low temperature, medium temperature, and high temperature. But uh, frankly, for a, a metamorphism that lies within a, such a narrow range of thermobaric ratios between 170 and 230, uh, this is uh, much more like a continuum of metamorphic process where increase in pressure simply leads to increasing temperature, whether or not that's directly related to lithostatic load. Once again, size matters. Exhumation rates for UHP metamorphism are much faster for small terrains and rather slower for large terrains, although they're all of course much quicker than for UHT terrains. And so we see here that the rates are on the order of uh, millimeters to tens of millimeters per year. And the style of exhumation is different from small to large terrains. This is interesting, but the number of terrains that are shown here is somewhat limited. Um, and the exhumation mechanisms are still rather poorly understood. So yet again, there's an area here that we might be wanting to look into in more detail. I would be remiss, of course, if uh, I didn't refer to the uh, Barrow Award winner in this talk. And so pseudosections and more pseudosections now dominate our lives and dominate the literature in metamorphic studies. And this goes back to Roger and Tim in the 1980s. And uh, I show a simple example of a UHT metamorphic rock from the Eastern Ghats on the right in, uh, in PT pseudosection. Also during the last 15 years, we've seen the development of single mineral thermometers and in this particular case, the uh, zirconium in rutile uh, thermometer records uh, temperatures up to eight, up 1,020 degrees, consistent with the peak temperatures determined from the pseudo section on the right. And the uh, titanium in zircon uh, temperatures around 900 or so record the crossing of the solidus on the cooling path, again, consistent with the pseudo section on the right. We can also uh, think in terms of metamorphism, tectonic setting and secular change. And as many of you will know, this is what I've been doing in the last few years, actually the last uh, 17 years, 16, 17 years. What I show on the right is a data set of 564 metamorphic localities. They're shown in relation to the uh, metamorphic fascias in the top left and in relation to thermobaric ratio on the top right and plotted by thermobaric ratio against age in the bottom. And low TP metamorphism shown in the blue forms in subduction channels at accretionary margins and during subduction of passive continental margins at the present day. And in the past, this is what we use to mark sutures in older origins. But of course, as you know, these rocks mostly only go back to the late near, near Proterozoic with a few examples in the Paleo Proterozoic. Intermediate TP metamorphism is associated with mountain building in the present, uh, in, in recent past. 
And it records orogenic thickening, thickening in older origins, or it records the orogenic welt, if you will, or the orogenic belt itself, strictly speaking. High TP metamorphism occurs in the orogenic hinterlands. So if you, if you like behind the orogenic belt, back arcs and plateaus in uh, recent past, and it records orogenic extension, I think, late orogenic extension in older origins. You can also see in the diagram on the bottom uh, right that uh, bimod bimodality starts appearing in the Paleoproterozoic. Bimodality is a feature of uh, metamorphism at uh, convergent plate margins. And shown here on the left is uh, the results of a statistical analysis of the metamorphic data set. And it confirms that the bimodal distribution of TP became increasingly distinct since the Paleoproterozoic. This appearance of bimodality is consistent with a growing consensus that plate tectonics reliably can be taken back to the Paleoproterozoic, but not before. I emphasize plate tectonics. That doesn't preclude subduction in the Archean. And we can think about what happens as we go back in Earth history. The uh, mantle potential temperature is almost certainly warmer by as much as perhaps 150 to 250 C by the time we get back to the uh, Archean Proterozoic boundary. And that changes the way that uh, the lithosphere behaves and how orogenic belts form and dip form. And what I show here is uh, the most recent of two uh, modeling studies from Chihoudry et al. And uh, you really only need to concentrate on the bottom right figure which emphasizes that location of intermediate TP metamorphic rocks is in the orogenic welt and the location of high TP metamorphic rocks is in the area behind the orogenic belt in the orogenic hinterland where late orogenic extension has enabled us to achieve the thermal conditions of UHT metamorphism. If we look at secular change in just a little bit more detail, I simply show the uh, moving mean of pressure for intermediate TP metamorphism in the, in the top figure. And uh, this appears to uh, increase through time, at least uh, until the beginning of the Neoproterozoic. And this directly uh, contradicts the recent paper by Tang et al. in, um, they, uh, science, in science. And in the bottom diagram, I show moving means of all three types of metamorphism. And uh, the important point here is that the, the highest thermobaric ratios for high TP metamorphism occur in the Mesoproterozoic, which is clearly nothing to do with the peak in mantle potential temperature, which occurs in the late Archean. So something's going on there. And if we look a little more carefully at this metamorphic data set, using sequential analysis, we can see, first of all, that there are significant changes in the Paleoproterozoic and in the late Neoproterozoic Cambrian. And these are related to the formation of two supercontinents, Columbia and the beginning of Pangaea, respectively. And we can also see that the, the peak of uh, this curve, which is the lowest curve for the whole data set, occurs during the Meso Mesoproterozoic. So that for the metamorphic data set as a whole, it peaks in the Mesoproterozoic, a period when it appears that we were dominantly supercontinental. And this suggests that there's a role, I think, for this peak in terms of mantle heat, and that relates to tectonic styles. So what does the future hold? I would say, what will we be doing in 40 years? Uh, but I think that is gonna be down to the younger members listening to us, this talk. How do metamorphic studies fit into the science priority questions of the current decade? And I apologize, that is uh, a little bit US centric, but I think it's important to mention nonetheless. So I want to point out that uh, MSA held its centennial symposium about 20 months ago. One of the 14 uh, themes in that symposium was a golden age, a second golden age for metamorphic studies. Um, after the first hundred years. And the two outstanding talks that uh, made up that session were by Ross Angel and Lucy Tajmanova. Both of those are available online through the Mineralogical Society of America, and they're both worth listening to. And of course, uh, it's inevitable that I have to lean on them a little bit since uh, it's only 20 months since they did some of the job that I've been asked to do here.
So what I'm showing here is perhaps where we are at present. We're coming to the end of this first golden age. We're very good at uh, certain things in the chemistry field, thermobarometry, geochemical cycling. We do a little bit of structure and microstructures. We know there's a relationship between melts, fluids, between the chemistry and me mechanics fields. And we've got a lot better, of course, at geochronology, petrochronology, timescales, and rates. And we have areas where these fields overlap with reaction kinetics, disequilibrium, tectonics, non-hydrostatic stress. What are we going to do for the future? How is this going to change for the future? We can't keep doing more of the same. So where is our future? I still kept the same three disciplines, if you will. Um, and I think the future lies where these overlap. Of course, we'll continue to make observations and measurements. Uh, we'll do these at ever smaller scale and ever lower concentrations, but whether we are actually able to explain these is uh, an interesting question to ask, and I don't think it's changed very much since Matt Cohn and Frank Speer asked the same question 21 years ago. We'll continue to see developments of thermodynamic data sets and AX models. We'll see greater use of disequilibrium features. Um, I've already suggested that maybe we need to have a better understanding of orogenic heating and cooling and exhumation. The big advance I think will come in coupling stress and kinetics. We'll obviously apply more Raman spectroscopy, but what are the science priority questions and how do we fit in it? And uh, Lucy Tajmanova was very concerned about whether there was a future for metamorphic studies or whether it would die. And if you look at this uh, science priority questions for the current decade, from a National Academy of Sciences Committee advising the National Science Foundation in the US. There are 12 priority questions. Of course, uh, petrology is not explicitly mentioned, it never is. But there are some places there where we can fit in and maybe this is what we need to be thinking about for the future rather than more PT studies. Where and why and how did plate tectonics start? Critical elements in, in being recycled. Relationship to earthquake behavior, slow slip, et cetera. Uh, what does Earth's past reveal about the dynamics of the climate system, particularly with respect to carbon sequestration, geological processes influencing biodiversity, and Earth science research in relation to geohazards? Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike. Do we have any quick questions or comments? You can put them in the chat. That was a really great overview of some of the, the fantastic work that's been done over the last 40 years and hopefully some food for thought for those of us thinking about the next 40 years and what to write our grant proposals on. So that was yeah really great. So does anyone have any questions for Mike? Um, okay, so we've got a question from Bruce. What do you think are the lessons for deep waste? Bruce, surely you know I know nothing about deep waste. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think the obvious lesson is that uh, we need to be more involved with it. Uh, okay, great. And Alex is asking, uh, what is your view on preservation bias, by analogy, the fossil record? I think there's two aspects to that. I think there's a survivorship bias. Uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, we, we tend to think that the RP and Crattons are the key. Um, maybe they're simply the survivors. Maybe there's uh, stuff we're missing and we'll never know about because it didn't survive the RP. So there's a survivorship bias as we go back in time to the Crattons. And then, of course, if we think in terms of orogenic belts, there's uh, clearly a preservation bias in orogenic belts. Uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at the distribution of ages of metamorphic rocks and distribution of UPB zircon ages from uh, igneous rocks, of which we have more than uh, 100,000 compiled now, the peaks are in the same places, suggesting that there's a preservation element, I think, to both the magmatic and metamorphic records. Whether or not there's also a variation in rate of crustal production associated with orogenesis, I think, remains uh, uncertain. Uh, but there's clearly both a survivorship and a preservation bias, and we need to be aware of that in the metamorphic record. Mm -hmm. 